in our last meeting, we were discussing the pros and cons of the anthropomorphic conception of deities. If you'll recall from our last meeting, I suggested that conceiving of deities, gods and goddesses in human form, basically, they're bigger, smarter, more beautiful than us, and they're immortal too, has its advantages. You can attempt to reason with or persuade an anthropomorphic god or goddess in ways you cannot persuade or try to reason with the animistic clock goddess. You can hopefully try to understand what is at work in the universe a lot better, the behavior of the forces of nature, if you attribute human personalities to them. For example, right around midterm, I predict you're all going to start trying to read my mind to see what kind of junk I'm going to put on the essay exam. Don't bother. It's not worth the trouble. But it's a human, natural human instinct to try to comprehend that which they're not exactly sure about in terms they can understand. Therefore, as human civilization becomes more advanced, that humans tend to conceive of gods and goddesses in human form. And that's how we get, if you'll recall from last time, from that big ball of fire in the sky, which proceeds from east to west, which the ancient Greeks called what? Do you recall? Hyperion, which is ancient Greek for... Yeah, that thingy that goes on high. Okay, big, bright, animistic ball of gas. Whereas, later still, we get this anthropomorphic deity named Helios. To a certain extent, Helios, let's gonna draw a nice bright sun crown on him too. He is the sun god after all. He is a god with human form who drives a chariot and wears a crown on his head, you know, gets to meet a lot of interesting women on his travels. And the advance is that you can pray to Helios, you can understand Helios, you can try to persuade or bribe Helios in ways you cannot bribe or pray to a big ball of gas. The shortcoming of anthropomorphism, the shortcoming of attributing human personalities, character traits, behavior patterns, and the like to gods and goddesses is sometimes they get so human that you really can't believe in them anymore. Let's briefly consider, briefly, because this is a review, the Greek god Helios. He works long hours. He never gets a vacation. He grabs his loving on the run. And when it turns out that, um, you know, he's becoming a daddy, does he spend any time with the kid? No. He's putting his career ahead of his family. Okay. Young Phaethon, his son, grows up in a one-parent family and wants to know his father better. The father feels very bad about the way he has treated his son and decides to make it all up at once by giving him the keys to the chariot with disastrous results. And we're supposed to believe that these people are deities? This sounds more like a sitcom than anything else. That I offer to you as one shortcoming of an anthropomorphic conception of deities. More about that later. It's time to create the universe. The ancient Greeks and Romans have left behind a couple of accounts of their views on the creation of the universe. These come to us from two primary sources. Number one is Hesiod, an ancient Greek fellow who lived right around 750 BC. He either lived then or some other time. And the second major source is a Roman who wrote in real life Latin named Ovid, 
who was alive around the time of Christ. If you subtract 750 from the current year, which is 1996, you get something like 1241. Try to think about what life was like 750 years ago in 1241 BC. It was nasty, brutish, and short. The life expectancy, average life expectancy for men was probably 32 years, for women 24. You probably lived in a little hut praying for survival every day. Life was a lot grimmer 750 years ago than it is today. Does anybody have any trouble with believing that? Does anybody want to believe that life was better 750 years ago, even to be difficult? No, Ray, I'm not interested. <laughs> Consequently, you would expect people today to have a brighter outlook on life. Just be generally more at peace with the universe, more optimistic about their place in life today than they would be 750 years ago. Does that make sense, Elizabeth? I caught you yawning. Don't you dare yawn in my class. Only I yawn in my class. Consequently, we can expect Ovid to have a much more optimistic worldview than Hesiod. And if you want to have a nice multisyllabic German word to throw around, I give extra points for this. Okay, I give extra points to people who use this word on essays. The word is Weltanschauung. Do we have any German students here or anybody who is German? Well, good, then you can't criticize my pronunciation. Weltanschauung is an all-encompassing, wonderful German buzzword for everything about your view on life. Everything about a civilization's view on life. Hesiod, who lived in much tougher times, will have a darker, more negative Weltanschauung. Whereas Ovid, who lives in kinder, gentler times, will have a kinder, gentler, more optimistic Weltanschauung. Okay, for those of you with parents or grandparents who grew up during the Depression, you will find out that they have a more depressing Weltanschauung than do we, I guess. What we're going to find out is that Ovid takes a lot of the details of Hesiod's creation. As a matter of fact, he takes pretty much the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker. Changes a few names, translates it into Latin, and calls it his own. Today, that would be called plagiarism, and don't you do it. But in ancient times, it was sincere admiration, sincere tribute to what he see I did. Well, I've babbled enough. Let's talk about creation. I think I mentioned to you last time that the ancient, civiliza ancient civilizations in general tend to explain the world about them in terms that they can understand. This means that the universe was not created, but born. Born out of what? To the ancient Greeks, according to Hesiod, the universe was born from something called chaos. C-H-A-O-S. Today it's used as a synonym for a disorderly situation or whatnot. The word chaos to the ancient Greeks means void, V-O-I-D, a great, big, empty space. It doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to recognize that the ancient Greeks conceived of chaos this great big empty void, as a cosmic womb out of which the world is born. 
if you think that's weird, I promise you it'll get weirder. I pause for your questions up to this point. Hesiod teaches us that the universe was born, as if you will, out of chaos. Okay, Kristen, you're yawning. You don't have any questions for me yet? Okay, excellent. I'm doing my usual excellent job. Chaos brought to life all by herself. Well, actually, the word chaos in ancient Greek is of the neuter gender. Neither male nor female, just to confuse matters further, I guess. Chaos brought into life five children. I'm going to erase Helios, and I'm going to erase Phaethon, and leave Weltanschauung up on the board for a while, because the order in which he uh, describes the um, creation of the universe is interesting, or I think it's interesting. First created was Gaia, or the Earth. In ancient Greek times, the Earth was conceived of like a giant frisbee made out of dirt. Okay, that's what I'm trying to draw here. Gaia is also known as Gay or Gia or what have you. Also created was Tartarus, which is the underworld. Okay, that area which is below the world, the earth, that is to say. We had Erebus which is the darkness under the earth. And we have night with a capital N, which is the darkness above the earth. Did I leave one out? Or did I cover them all? Pardon? No, Erebus is the darkness down here. Eros, thank you, Molly. Eros, what is Eros? Love. Okay, here we are talking about the physical features of the universe. Tartarus, the boundary of the underworld. Erebus, the darkness of the underworld. Gia, the earth. Night, the darkness above the earth. And Love. What's love got to do with it? Besi uh, why is it there? Somebody answer. I know, it's there in my lecture notes. Somebody tell me why you got to have love. You're everything is created. Everything is born or created. What's your name? Phil. Way to go, Phil. Everything is born, not created. There has got to be this cosmic urge to rut. These gods and goddesses must copulate copiously in order to beget the rest of the features of the universe. And before we go into the next generation of deities here, I fully expect that at least one person, I'm hoping, will be wanting to jump out of their chair saying, wait a minute, this is pretty sick all the incest going on here. What gives? Keep in mind that the dating pool as of this stage in world history is mighty small. Gaia, all by herself, brings into existence Uranus, and please do pronounce it that way, the sky, the big expanse of blue stuff, Pontus, who is the ocean, which I am indicating here, the ancient Greeks thought of the ocean as surrounding the giant frisbee of the earth, and mountains, here and there and whatnot. So far, so good. Gaia brought these creatures into existence by, by herself. I should also point out that, so far, we are dealing with an animistic conception of deity. That is to say, Uranus, 
is the ancient Greek word for sky. Gaia is the ancient Greek word for earth. Pontus is an ancient Greek word for ocean. Yeah, we have an earth goddess. Her name is Earth. Up to this point, I would be willing to bet that when this view is current, it's a very old, very antique view. By the time that Hesiod was writing this down, it was open to question whether this is what really happened. Although, interestingly enough, Hesiod believes every single word he writes. He actually believes that what, hap what I'm going to describe next actually happened. We are dealing with a purely animistic conception of gods and goddesses. No personalities. No, or very few, starting to hedge, human behavior traits. Gaia next mingles in love with her, with her son, Uranus. Remember, the dating pool is very, very small at this point in the history of the universe. And produces oodles and oodles of children. It's necessary for gods at the beginning of ancient creation myth to be very, very studly. It's necessary for goddesses to be very, very fertile. Gaia and Uranus have three groups of children. Group number one is commonly known as the Titans. We've already met two of the Titans, Hyperion, the big ball of fire in the sky, and his wife, Thea which is just an ancient Greek word which means godly. Neither here nor there. These titans, these, eight, these 12 titans, are semi, I would say semi-anthropomorphic. That is to say that they do have personalities. They generally are portrayed with human faces and human bodies and the like but they are not quite as anthropomorphic as, are the la as is the last de generation of deities led by Zeus and Hera. Uranus is the sky god. Gaia is the earth mother. They have 12, chil 12 children who are titans, and Uranus is pleased with them. By the way, does anybody want to guess why Uranus is the boss in this marriage? Anybody want to go out on a limb? Very good. Patrilineal, patriarchal society. Even though Gaia is Uranus's mother and wife, um, well, just keep in your mind the following question. What precisely are Uranus's qualifications for ruling the universe? Ask yourself that question. What precisely are Uranus's qualifications for running the universe? Because he is the boss. He is the leader in this relationship. They have a whole mess of other kids known as the Hecaton Shires. The Hecaton Shires are very ugly. They have one, they have, how does this go? Two arms each, no, 50 arms each, or 100 arms each, there you go, with 100 hands. There we go, I was just doing the math in my head. And in order for them to have 100 hands, they must also have 100 arms. They are very, very ugly. In addition to the hundred handers, they also have three kids who are cyclopes. And no matter how hard you try, it is very difficult to draw a cute little cyclops baby. These three kids are also very, very ugly. They are so ugly, in fact, 
that Uranus decides to banish them to the underworld. Now, we are starting to pick up, we're starting to pick up anthropomorphic traits being assigned to animistic gods and goddesses. You'll recall that I said Uranus is the Greek word for sky that um, Gia is the ancient Greek word for Earth. These children of Uranus, the sky god, and Gia, the earth goddess, are so ugly that Uranus decides to put them into the underworld, and that's what we're, where we're going to leave them for the time being. We'll leave them there for about five minutes while I ask again for questions. Crystal. Hundred handers, you can call them the hundred. Does that include them too? Yep, they're all down there in Tartarus. Mark. I just want to make sure you said that the gay had produced Uranus, Pontus, and the mountain is just by herself. All by herself. That's pretty tricky. Well, <laughs> yes, it is. The technical term for that, I'm not going to put it on the test, is parthenogenesis. And if means birth from a virgin. And if, um, you know, once you've encountered more ancient accounts of um, creation, you will be considerably less surprised. Okay? Well, not to give it away, Mark, but we're going to find a time when she was wondering that herself. Okay? She probably started to wonder that herself. Carolyn. Talking about Tartarus, um, why in the beginning was there a need to bring in a darkness for Tartarus? Brilliant question, Farallon. Why was there a need for darkness, right? Yeah, Tartarus. What comes first? Darkness or light? I know that's a question on the order of what comes first, the chicken and the egg, but in most civilizations, Farallon, darkness precedes light. Yeah kind of fixated on what is beneath rather than above. We can get back to that one later, actually, when we talk about the mystery religions. But I'm getting some questions. That's good. More questions. Maybe one I can actually answer. Okay, then I will plow on to give you another buzzword. The ancient Greeks tended, like most other ancient civilizations, to explain life about them in terms I can understand. How many times have I said that already? My theory of teaching is to repeat that over and over again until you learn it only to make me shut up. They conceived of the universe in terms they could understand. When they asked, how did the vegetation get here? They thought about the one process of creation that they knew something about, which was sex. Vegetation comes about through sex. The sky god, who is on top, and the earth goddess, who is on the bottom, perform, if you will, the love deed. And at the culmination of the love deed, of the sexual act, rain takes place, which stands for the seed, which Mother Earth receives and nurtures in her entrails until it is time to give birth to vegetation. Now, no doubt you think that this is pretty silly. Although, if you have ever been caught out in the middle of a thunderstorm all of a sudden, you might not think it's all that strange. But the ancient Greeks, God bless them, are only applying what they know about human creation to the creation of vegetation. And the name for this setup, this concept, in which a sky god and an earth goddess have sex, um, culminating in rain, which stands for the seed, which impregnates the earth goddess, which causes her to bring up all sorts of good things to eat. This thingy is called, I will write it over here, Heros Gamos, 
which is ancient Greek for sacred marriage. The sacred marriage between the sky god and the earth goddess. It exists in other civilizations. Okay, it's a pretty popular explanation. Gaia and Uranus are the first example of the Greek version of the Hieros Gamos. I've been known to throw that on essay questions. There are going to be more. For the most part, if you ever find yourself writing about this on an essay question, I don't know how much more blatant I can be, um, you might point out that this first version of the Hieros Gamos in ancient Greek myth, Gaia and Uranus, is almost totally animistic. Gaia is the ancient Greek word for earth. Uranus is the ancient Greek word for sky. They mingle in love through the agency of Eros, and it explains the vegetation. It also explains a whole raft of kids, the 12 good-looking titans, the eight, well, the 100 ugly hecatonchires, 100 handers, and the three ugly cyclopes. I pause for a question up to this point. I think I'm explaining this well. Mark? Um, I guess I'm not. just wondering, since Eros is kind of the mechanism that gets everyone going together, mm -hmm. does she do anything herself? He. Uh, no, uh, it, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, actually, Mark, because this Eros is kind of an animistic urge to rut. It gets kind of embarrassing because the goddess Aphrodite also has a son named Eros, who's a very handsome, studly looking, completely anthropomorphic guy. It's like the two people in the room who say they're Napoleon. If Mona and I both insist that we're Napoleon, when you're thinking about this like the ancient Greeks thought about it, we can both be Napoleon. Good question, very well answered. Is Eros also kind of a neuter? Yeah. Yes. Okay. In order to have some... Question. Okay, got to put that pen down because I'll ask you a question if you don't. Um, Gaia and Uranus have the 12 nice kids and the whole parcel of ugly kids. The ugly kids get sent down to the underworld. How many people in this room are moms? You're not a mom? No, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. How many people in this room are mothers? Okay, thank you. You are probably the nicest person in the whole wide world, unless... Has anybody ever seen this behavior in their mom? I have a mom like this, too. Nicest person in the world until you mess with one of her kids. Gaia is a loving, nurturing, giving goddess. But Uranus has just messed with her kids, bringing out what I fondly refer to as the maternal urge to kill, where an otherwise laid-back, easy-going, average female becomes a fanged monster with a bloodlust, and a, in, you ever have that? Okay, good. I mean, Dads have it too, but moms have it really bad. You know, they lift up cars and throw them and stuff like that when they're really got the adrenaline pumping. She goes to her children, the Titans, and says, which of you will avenge your siblings? Which of you will have revenge on your father, Uranus, for sending the hundred-handers, the Hecatonshires, and the Cyclopes down to Tartarus. She asks them in their birth order. Nope, no, nope, nope, no thanks, Mom, nope, no. Nope. Like most siblings. Quite sure that if my mom asked my siblings to do something like that for me, they'd say, no, let him rot, let him rot. But the youngest, Cronus, the baby of the bunch, says, I'll do it, Mom. And so, according to Hesiod, 
who believed, by the way, that every word of this was absolutely true, will let Hesiod pick up the call. After Gaia and Uranus had enjoyed the love deed, and Uranus was relaxed, Cronus withdrew from the bosom of Mother Earth an enormous stone sickle. Yes, you can see where this is going, gentlemen. And castrated Uranus. Normally I accompany this with a rather grotesque gesture. The severed testicles of Uranus drop into the ocean, okay, causing foam to rise up from the ocean. Remember, these, um, these sky gods are very fertile characters. And up from the foam comes a, <laughs> a rising up a goddess. Remember that Hesiod believes that this is all true, and he believes that anybody who chuckles at this and laughs is going to fry. Okay? And up from the foam comes a bubbling, the goddess... What's your name? Scott. Scott. Aphrodite. Very good. Did you read the book? I don't mean to make fun of you. Thank you. The goddess Aphrodite. And what is she the goddess of? The goddess of... You got it. She's known to the Romans as... Venus. She's our Venus. And what is appropriate about the circumstances of her birth? Farallon? Okay, we'll take that giggle and smirk as an acknowledgement that, of course, the goddess of love, the goddess of the urge to rut, the goddess who's got every other goddess and god in the whole Greek pantheon wrapped around her finger. That is a very logical way for her to be born. And also, from the drops of blood from the severed genitalia of Uranus that hit the earth, we get creatures known as the Furies. They are not very nice. We will meet them later. Crystal? How do you spell that? Pardon? How do you spell that? Which one? A P H R O D I T E. And we now have a second generation of gods and goddesses ruling the universe according to the ancient Greeks. Because Uranus has lost his credentials to rule the universe. Supposedly, he is assigned a position in Tartarus. It's not one of these deals where, okay, let's all stop believing in Uranus, because how can you stop believing in the sky? Oh yes, the god Uranus is still there to the ancient Greeks, but he's no longer the boss. He's lost his credentials. Gaia, likewise, continues with her position as Earth Goddess, a difficult one to give up, but she is no longer a part of the ruling couple. The ruling couple, the king and queen, the master and the mistress of the universe, are Cronus and Rhea. Cronus, after all, is the god who castrated Uranus. Rhea is his wife. He took the risk, he gets the benefits. Cronus and Rhea are the second example in ancient Greek mythology of the Hieros Gamos, the sacred marriage between sky god and earth goddess. Now I know what you're going to say. Cronus is not the sky. No, he's not. Cronus is a god who is mostly anthropomorphic. Rhea is a goddess who is mostly anthropomorphic, although I will suggest the ancient Greek word Rhea means flowing. 
it means, well, let's not dwell on that too much. It's not a big jump. It means abundant. It means giving. It is an attribute of Mother Earth, the abundant one. Cronus and Rhea, king and queen of the universe, have human characteristics. They have human personality traits. Rhea has the typical ones you would expect. She has the, what did I name that syndrome just a couple minutes ago? The maternal, the maternal urge to kill syndrome. She, we're going to find that. And Cronus also has a discernible human character trait. Does anybody want to guess? what Chironis' single distinguishing human character trait is? Stupidity. He is as dumb as a box of rocks. Here's what happens. Cronus thinks he's mighty smart. He thinks about how, it, how he came to power. <clears throat> And he thinks about, he hears an oracle tell him that you will be succeeded by one of your children. He doesn't have many options. He is, after all, a fertile sky kind of god. His wife is a fertile earth kind of goddess. No, Kristen, you're, you are Kristen, right? They are not the earth and sky, respectively. But Eros is still working. They have to mingle in love. This is the dawn of time. There is no such thing as birth control. Then what kind of birth control is going to hold down the supreme god and the supreme goddess anyway? And so every time that Rhea gives birth to one of her children, Cronus is waiting to take the little baby and devour the little baby. The oldest child is Hera. When she is born, she is brought kicking and screaming into the world and Cronus eats her. Poseidon, who will grow up to be the influential sea god when he is born, gloop. Hades, Hestia, Demeter, gloop, gloop, gloop. After five of these occurrences, I don't, I'm not sure Rhea is too quick on the uptake herself, but she catches on before Cronus does. My wife assures me that this is the way it works out. She get, I'm sick and tired of carrying these children to term, giving birth to them, and then having my husband eat them. <laughs> she goes to consult her mom and dad, Gaia and Uranus. And we don't have this story written out, but apparently they give her some advice that she resolves to carry through. The next time she's about ready to give birth to her sixth, last, and youngest child, a boy named Zeus, I like that, um, she conceives a plan. When she gives birth to the little dude, Instead of wrapping the baby Zeus up in swaddling clothes and saying, here you go, she has the midwife wrap up a rock in swaddling clothes. <laughs> and when um, Cronus says, okay, give me the kid, they hand him the rock, which is wrapped in swaddling baby clothes. And guess what he does? He eats it. What a genius. Okay. Meanwhile, the little infant baby Zeus is taken away to the island of Crete, which is an island in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, where he is raised by a magical goat <laughs> with the horn of plenty. There was this one, it was a wonder goat with a couple of horns and you broke off one of her horns and all sorts of good food like 
apples and oranges and bacon and Bavarian cream donuts would come out. And various men with shields and spears were stationed outside the cave door so that whenever little Zeus started howling and yowling, they would clash their spears against their shields so Cronus wouldn't notice that Rhea had pulled a fast one on him, which in fact he did. I pause for your questions here. Crystal, you have a question? Mike? Okay. Of course, it is fated that Zeus is going to be the master of the universe. He grows to adulthood, or young adulthood, in this tiny cave in Crete, and one day when he's in his late teens, he decides that he is going to claim what is his own. We don't have the details of what's coming next. So if anybody raises their hand and says, wait a minute, what are the logistics of this? I'm going to raise up my hands and say, are you threatening me? I cannot answer the question, how precisely did this happen? But according to Hesiod, who believe that every word of this is true, Zeus caused Cronus to vomit up his five siblings. How many of you have ta taken Psych 121 and are familiar with Dr. Freud's theory of penis envy, <laughs> in which women behave the way they do because they wish they were guys, basically, right? Here we have, in a myth that goes back more than 4,000 years and was preserved by a patriarchal society, an instance of a father devouring his young after his wife gives birth to them and then spewing them back up. This is the first Greek instance of womb envy. There will be more. So next time you women or Americans hear the theories about penis envy or the myths concerning penis envy, use this. It's a good story. The battle between the two generations of gods, the Titans and Zeus and his siblings, is known as the Titanomachy, which is basically ancient Greek for Clash of the Titans. I prefer not to call it Clash of the Titans because it evokes images of a poor down on his luck Laurence Olivier, you know, acting in a movie with that talented thespian Harry Hamlin. Great actor, great actor, right? What is, Cl is Clash of the Titans about Perseus? What a, okay, we'll talk more about that later. I promise. What I want to stress now is not so much the dirty details of the battle, but again, we have two, two generations of gods and goddesses duking it out for who gets to be the ruler of the universe. Pause for a question. Go ahead. Okay. The production values are the best, the special effects are the best the Greeks can muster. Cyclopes throwing thunderbolts, exploding mountain tops, heat and rain and storms and thunder. Yes? Were they also fighting? They were just basically there. This is a struggle between the Titans on one hand and this and Zeus and his siblings on the other. So why would the mountaintop explode? Um, well, ever watch a war movie in which there weren't any tanks exploding? 
I, I, I don't mean to be a snot, but I mean, I mean, or a Rambo movie in which nobody gets killed. Mm -hmm. Oh, they break off mountain tops and throw them, divert boiling rivers and stuff like that. You know, you're threatening me. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. That's a very noble thing to do. There are only two out of the whole pack, only two out of the whole pack of titans support Zeus. And actually, it's just one titan and her son. This is important. The titan at Themis. T-H-E-M-I-S supports Zeus. This is important because the word Themis in ancient Greek means right with a capital R. Of course, the goddess of right and justice is going to be on Zeus's side. Because the author, Hesiod, believes that every word of this is happening. He believes implicitly that Zeus is the boss. He doesn't want to say that right with a capital R in justice or on Cronus's side, does he? And also Themis's older son. Themis has two sons. Their names are Prometheus and Epimetheus. Prometheus in ancient Greek means Mr. Foresight, the guy who knows what's going to happen next. Recognizing a winner when he sees one, Prometheus goes over to the Zeus team. Epimetheus, his younger, dumber brother, Mr. Hindsight, sides with Cronus, sides with a loser. There's really no point really in belaboring the details. The, the production values of the clash between gods and titans are as best as they can be around 750 BC. Zeus and his siblings win. Zeus and his siblings are completely anthropomorphic. And Zeus's rise to power represents the rise of a third completely anthropomorphic generation of gods and goddesses. These gods and goddesses, well, especially Zeus and Hera, are so anthropomorphic that it's difficult to believe in them sometimes. Hera and Zeus also represent the third and final instance of Hieros Gamos in Greek mythology. The third and final. Pardon? Zeus and Hera. Well, of course. She's his big sister. Why didn't Rhea side with Zeus? That too. Why didn't Rhea side with Zeus? Yeah, she, didn't she want all of this for Cronus anyway? Didn't she start all of this? Well, she just gets credit for being on her husband's side. Stand by your guy, though he may cheat and lie, that sort of thing. Um, we just have it on Hesiod's authority that Themis and Prometheus alone of the Titans sided with Zeus. Now, I probably is somewhat of a giveaway. I told you that, um, that Hera and Zeus represent the third and last version of the Hieros Gamos in Greek mythology. That means I'm telling you ahead of time that Zeus will not be replaced. Let me, before we conclude for the day, let you in on one little secret as a teaser, if you will, and then you can all go. Don't close your books all at once or I'll make you stay another five minutes. Zeus doesn't know for a fact that he is the final king of the universe. When Zeus thinks about how he came to power, once Zeus thinks about how his dad took power from his grandfather, 
he gets a little paranoid. And as we're going to find out at the beginning of our next exciting class, Zeus has good reasons for being paranoid. You've been a good class. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.